everyone, and welcome to Observatory Nights at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. We're very pleased that you could join us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about astronomy, I think of shining stars, glimmering galaxies, and glowing nebulas. But the universe has a dark side. And this fall, we are going to explore it by going into the darkness with a series of presentations. Now, tonight is all about dust in the Milky Way. Now, cosmic dust can scatter starlight and create beautiful astronomical images like the glowing blue wisps that we see around the Pleiades star cluster. But dust can also be a nuisance. It acts like you know, smudges on your window and can actually block the view of the things, the more distant things that you want to see and study. So tonight's speaker, Doug Finkbeiner, is a Harvard professor of astronomy and of physics. He's probably best known in the wider world for being the discoverer of a giant, mysterious structure in our galaxy known as Fermi bubbles. But Doug also is the leader of a project that is striving to create a 3D map of dust in our Milky Way galaxy by studying observations of a billion stars. So tonight, he is going to tell us all about that challenge and what we have learned along the way. Please welcome Doug Finkbeiner. Christine, oh, she gave such a talk now. Um, so uh, this is kind of the joking title, and this is the more serious title page, um, which is more fun if you have a movie running in the background. So I'm going to talk about mapping our home galaxy, the Milky Way, in both two and three dimensions. And uh, a lot of the work I'm going to show you has been done by my former students, Gregory Green and Eddie Schlafly. And uh, we are here, I work there, and it's funded by the NSF. <laughs> so why do we make maps? Um, in general, you know, humans make maps because they want to know where they are. Well, there, that's where you are. That's the only map you'll ever need. Um, <laughs> but if you're going to travel some other place, you need a map of the other stuff in between, right? So uh, we just want to know the larger context of where we are. We'd like to understand other things in the universe. And it's just amazing how every time you try to look at an object over here, you find there's some dust between you and that, and you need to correct your measurements for the dust. So we, we want to map out our Milky Way, uh, among other things. And we could do it with stars or dust or even gas. These are some images from the Spitzer Space Telescope. And I remember when these were new about uh, 12 years ago. This is M81. And, and this is how we usually see it in stars. But this is actually the dust in the galaxy. And you see it looks somewhat different. The dust is clumpier, tends to come in, in clumpy clouds. Uh, the stellar distribution is a little smoother. This is kind of near infrared, so the, this starlight isn't very affected by the dust. If we looked at optical UV bands, you'd see darkness where the dust is. Um, so uh, that was just an example of what a galaxy kind of looks like in dust and stars. Dust interferes with the measurements of stars, and uh, stars kind of help with the measurements of dust. So you really have to do both. They're two sides of the same coin. Dust interferes with other things also. The cosmic microwave background is something that uh, physicists and astronomers have been very interested in for 50 years since it was discovered. And uh, when you look at the microwave sky, so these are nine maps of the sky at different microwave frequencies, starting at 30 gigahertz, going up to 857. So this is already almost 10 times the frequency of your microwave oven. So uh, these microwaves aren't very good at cooking food if you stick your food out here in the universe. It'll just get cold. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, as you go through different frequencies here, you see there's the cosmic microwave background anisotropy, the part we're interested at high galactic latitudes. Each of these is a map of the whole sky, and the plane of our galaxy is cutting across the middle of it. We're interested in this stuff up here. We'd like to see it over the whole sky, but there's all this dust in the way. And the higher the frequency, the more you see the dust. 
So you'd like to clean up the dust and get something nice and clean and beautiful like that. This is mostly real. They, they did a little fakery right in the galactic plane here to make something that looks real. But, uh, you know, we can study maps like this and look at the uh, fluctuations in them and learn things about the early universe. Because this light has been coming to us uh, for about 13.7 billion years, since the time when the universe was only about three or 400,000 years old. So that's, you know, one application of this. When Christine said dust is a nuisance, that's one of the things she has in mind, right? That if you don't understand the dust thoroughly, you'll make mistakes when you look at the microwave background. It also interferes with large scale structure. So um, Harvard is, you know, one of the great astronomy departments in the country. And uh, one of its claims to fame a few decades ago was doing the first redshift survey. So um, Mark Davis and John Tonnery and what, Huckra, Geller, Latham, some combina combination of those folks went out and measured one by one the redshift of each of these galaxies. And then because the universe is expanding, the more redshift the galaxy has, the further away it is. And so you can make a, a kind of three-dimensional map. This is just a slice through the three-dimensional map. And here, you know, in 1982, someone wrote, you are here uh, in the center of it. Yet another you are here map that's useless. And uh, so the point is that um, d if there's dust from our galaxy right up very close to us relative to these scales, if there's dust in the way, we make mistakes about inferring where the galaxies are and how many there are and how bright they are. And uh, here's a more modern version of that kind of thing from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this is looking out farther in more detail this is still just a slice, but Sloan looked at some huge volume. So now we do this for a million galaxies. And uh, there's a survey called DESI that's starting up that some of us here at Harvard are involved with that will measure redshift for 20 million galaxies. But I digress. Um, so what I'd like to convince you is that, well, first, that dust is interesting. I mean, dust is not the kind of thing, you know, you go to college, you get a degree, get into a good grad school like Berkeley and start working with a famous professor. And then you have that conversation with your mother. What are you working on? <laughs> and, you know, everyone wants to say, well, I'm discovering a, a new planet that we're going to go move to or I'm, but yeah, you know, well, I'm working on dust. And then there's this long pause. <laughs> but dust is actually interesting. Um, so I'm going to try to Convince you of that, talk a little bit about how dust reddens starlight and galaxy light, how we make dust maps, both in two dimensions and also in three dimensions, and then what we're going to try to do in the future. So just a little more about what dust looks like. Here's kind of the poster child black cloud Bernard 68. This was from a survey of dark dust clouds done by uh, a guy named Bernard a long time ago, about 100 years ago. And you see, you can't see any stars through this dust cloud. It's just amazing. Um, so that would be a dark cloud. There are also reflection nebulae. This is also dust. So if there's a bright star next to the dust, the light from the star reflects off it, and the dust can actually look bright. Uh, this is a piece of the Witch Head Nebula. In general, both things are going on. So it starts to get confusing, right? There's some dust here. It's definitely black if you're like trying to see stars through it, but then it's reflecting light off of some stars that are kind of buried in the outer envelopes of it here. So um, in general, you look at an image like this. If somebody asked you, OK, tell me exactly how much dust there is along each line of sight in this image, by looking at it, you, you can't really do that. It's just hard. Uh, a little more eye candy. The Hubble Space Telescope kind of you know, really revolutionized uh, the pretty picture business <laughs> back when I was in grad school and uh, started making images like this. And, you know, it was really kind of fun to see pictures of dust on the front page of the New York Times. It wasn't this image, it was the Pillars of Creation image, but, uh, you know, that's, that's one you can tell your mother about. Uh, so that's, that's a good one. Here's another good one. I don't know, a lot of the prettiest images in astronomy really involve dust in my opinion. Even if you look at things like this, so this is an artist's conception of Cassini flying past Saturn, and the rings of Saturn are what make it special. 
Um, actually, <laughs> kind of a funny story. When I was uh, a grad student, I went up to Lick Observatory in Mount Hamilton, you know, the first mountaintop observatory in the world, 1888, 36-inch refractor. Very fun place to visit. And the, the guy who was showing us the telescope said, this is a very special night. You're so lucky. This is the one of only three nights this century when Saturn's rings are exactly edge on. And he showed us Saturn and there were no rings. And, and my, my future wife was with me and she was so disappointed. <laughs> I had to take her back later and show her Saturn with the rings because the rings are kind of important. And, and, you know, they're basically, you know, they're just big dust grains. I mean, it's all just dust. So, okay, so I've kind of driven that home point. So what is this stuff? Um, it's hard for me to go out into interstellar space and grab some dust grains and bring them back for you, but we can go into interplanetary space, you know, not too far afield, and get samples of dust and bring them back. And you see, they look kind of like, well, especially this one, you know how in, in uh, uh, um, a Cambridge winter, you know, the, it snows and the snow looks so beautiful at first, and then it melts and freezes, melts and freezes, gets a little dirt on it, and pretty soon you kind of have a dirty snowball. Um, kind of looks like that. So uh, you can imagine this stuff has sort of gotten hot and cooled off and gotten hot and cooled off different times. Um, this looks more like just a chunk of a, a piece of uh, quartz broke off or something. So these are pieces of interplanetary dust. Um, they're basically pieces of comets and asteroids. Out in interstellar space, they're smaller. They're going to be like, you know, the size of one of these little blobs on here. Okay, but uh, so they're smaller than one micron. Um, but, but you don't see those at all in the solar system. There's this effect that I won't go into called pointing Robertson drag that takes very small dust grains and drags them into the sun on a fairly short time scale, like a million years. So if you wait around a million years, they're all gone. So, uh, well, you're laughing, but the, you know, Earth's 4.6 billion years old, so that's 4,600 times older. So a million years is nothing. So, uh, okay, so what could dust be made of? There's a, a long laundry list of things, much longer than this. Silicates, carbonaceous grains like graphite, silicon carbide, ices, and I mean, you know, not just water ice, but ammonia ice, CO2 ice, other things like that. There's iron in a lot of these, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's, you know, that's too much for people to model. So let's just assume we have a spherical cow, as we say in the business, and uh, just talk about two things. So silicates, like beach sand. This happens to be a picture I took in Akajima, Japan, but, you know, ignore the cute guy here and just look at the sand. <laughs> and um, when we say carbonaceous, we mean on the big end, things like graphite, well, not that big, but, uh, and then on the small end, really exhaust coming out of a tailpipe, more or less, the, the kinds of hydrocarbon molecules, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are uh, coming out of an exhaust pipe. So, uh, so, you know, people often say, what is dust? You know, on Earth, dust tends to be skin cells and, you know, pieces of dirt from outside and decomposed bacteria and all kinds of fun things. Uh, but, but, a lot of it has an organic origin, and so uh, for interstellar dust, you have to think a little differently. Kind of sand is a closer thing. So what does it do? Well, it reddens starlight. This is just a sunset in Roatan, Honduras. Um, but dust also scatters starlight and makes it redder for the same reason that the uh, scattering the sky makes the sunset red. So dust in front of a star makes it redder and fainter than it otherwise would be. Astronomers are really clever about naming things. We call this effect of reddening. Does all dust redden the same way? I mean, if you have dust that's made of silicates or graphite or very small hydrocarbons, well, it's complicated. Um, but it appears that the reddening, if, if we take these, you know, beautiful rainbow spectra things and, and make them a boring uh, line plot like we like to do, um, we can plot how much basically think how much light we lose as a function of wavelength. This is actually inverse wavelength because astronomers are perverse, so everything has to be plotted backwards. But anyway, uh, so this is just giving you some idea that uh, the wavelength dependence of the dust reddening 
is kind of in this family of curves. And so there's, there's a free parameter here that we'd like to know. So there's kind of two things. On every line of sight, we want to know how much dust is there and sort of what kind of dust is it parameterized by this number R or sometimes RV. But I promised to talk about a map. I'll come back to that other stuff later. Um, so for decades, we've had maps of dust that were two-dimensional. So we're sitting here on Earth looking out at the sky, looking at the celestial sphere. So by 2D, I mean the map on the sphere. Uh, but we also want to know sometimes how far away stuff is. If we're looking at the structure of our own galaxy, we're interested in the three-dimensional uh, part because we want to know how far each dust cloud is. So there are really two different kinds of dust mapping projects you can do, and they're really pretty different because cosmologists want to look out of the galaxy in the places with the least dust and do cosmology. And they just care about the total amount of dust along line of sight. They just want a, a 2D map and they want it to be as high fidelity as possible. Whereas, you know, 3D map, you want distances, you don't care that it's that high fidelity. You know, if it's off by 1%, you don't care. So uh, we actually do these things in different ways. So here are the ways people have attempted to map dust in the past. Um, you can look at the dust emission. So as I said, these dust grains are absorbing and scattering starlight. The absorption makes them hotter. They have to cool off. They emit far infrared radiation in microwaves. So you can look at that. There are satellites like IRS in the 1980s was designed to look at the far infrared emission from dust and other things. Uh, and uh, a related project called Kobe, in the, Kobe Derby in the 90s, and then Planck is the latest thing just in recent years has been making much better measurements of this. Or you can look at stuff that's correlated with dust but isn't dust. So H1 refers to neutral atomic hydrogen. Uh, we can see that with radio telescopes. Carbon monoxide, we can look at molecular gas. Um, there's a lot more hydrogen than carbon monoxide in the universe, but carbon monoxide is a really good emitter. So it's actually really easy to see. Um, so those are the main things people have used. Uh, or you look at the effect on starlight. So you actually use the stars themselves to see where the dust is. And that's what we've been doing. Green's my student here, so this is our project. Um, there are lots of pros and cons to these different things. I don't necessarily want to dwell on this, but uh, the point is just that each of these techniques really does have advantages and disadvantages. So you really want to try all approaches and then combine what you learn from each of them. Um, in particular, since I'm going to talk about the 3D stuff more, um, you know, it really measures what you want to know. These other things are measuring things that are correlated with what you want to know. This actually measures what you want to know if you're doing cosmology. You want to know how much light you're losing to the dust. So you measure exactly that. And that's a good thing. Um, but I'll just take uh, two slides here on the emission-based maps because that's how people have done it for decades. And uh, so this is kind of the recipe for how to do that. You measure the far infrared emission um, at many wavelengths, but you know, primarily you need at least one wavelength. And uh, now there's more things in that than just the dust we're interested in. There's the dust in our solar system, the interplanetary dust. And there's a lot less of it, but it's much, much hotter and much, much brighter. So it's really glowing fiercely, even though there's so little of it, we don't really care about its effects on absorbing starlight. So we've got to get rid of that. And that's one of the hardest things to do. Then there's a background of all the galaxies in the universe, all the you know little distant high redshift uh, galaxies emitting infrared that we don't care about either. And they're all on the map, so we've got to get rid of them. Then we have to assume some kind of model for what the temperature of the dust is doing uh, and, and how we can infer that from how bright it is at different wavelengths. Basically, what's the color? Just like a, a, an electric burner, if it's hotter, it glows kind of a brighter, hotter color than if it's colder. We're doing the same thing here, just measuring at different wavelengths, getting a color and determining how hot the dust is. Uh, and then once we finally have a map of all that stuff and we've made all these corrections, we have to calibrate it to something. So we take a bunch of stars or galaxies where we think we know the answer and calibrate it. So, you know, this actually works pretty well. This is um, something that I did as a grad student with my thesis advisor, Mark Davis, and another student, Dave Schlegel. And we made a map that looked like this in 1998. And um, 
we, we actually had no idea how popular it would be. We knew that the previous dust map that people used was one of the most cited papers in the field. But um, this data product has been used sort of by more people and in more ways than I would have ever possibly imagined. So, uh, and there's been very little competition for making another dust map too. So it's both true that everybody needs to know where the dust is and how much there is as precisely as possible and nobody wants to tell their mother that they're working on a dust map. <laughs> so uh, really, this had no competition until just recent years. The Planck map, um, which is being rendered in a different color scheme here, but looks almost identical on this scale. You have to you know, zoom in and look carefully to see how it's better. Um, but yeah, that, that went about 16 years with essentially no competition. So, um, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back and say, those maps look great, we're done, we can go home. But in the LSST era, so that refers to this big eight meter telescope they're building in Chile, the large synoptic survey telescope, three billion pixel camera on an eight meter telescope. It can scan the whole sky that's available that time of year every three nights. So um, massively more powerful survey instrument than anything that exists right now. And that'll be coming online in a few years. And so once that starts in that era, a lot of the things we want to do for that project will be limited by our knowledge of dust. And the kinds of maps we have now, even these snazzy new maps from Planck are not good enough. So, um, and part of it's they're measuring emission, not reddening. We, we actually want to know the reddening. We need to know this RV parameter I mentioned, even though it's kind of a boring detail, it's really critical to making all of this stuff work. Um, and then also, um, so this is a special week to astronomers. Uh, September 14th is not only the one year anniversary of the gravitational wave discovered by LIGO, rah, rah, but it's the zeroth anniversary of the Gaia data release. So this satellite Gaia flown by the European Space Agency and others is uh, measuring very precise positions of a billion stars. And by precise, I mean about a hundred times better than they've been measured previously. And when you know the positions of things that precisely, you can watch them move. You can look at the parallax shift as the Earth goes around the sun and figure out how far away they are. You get all kinds of great information. And so I really think there's a Milky Way structure revolution right around the corner because of this great new data set that came out yesterday. So we've all been very excited about this. And I actually spent a lot of time making plots of Gaia data instead of preparing this talk. So hopefully we'll. Um, so, uh, and, and because of that, the point is we need a 3D dust map, right? So, um, pan stars. So we have this photometry in five colors of light. Those stand for green, red, infrared, more infrared, even more infrared. Of <laughs> about, uh, I generally say roughly a billion. I guess we're actually using 800 million stars only. Uh, and then there's another survey called Two Mass that does near infrared. E even, even more infrared uh, than that. There are just many colors of infrared. And uh, so from this, we are going to learn distances to specific dust clouds, combine it with the other maps of gas we have, where we have velocity information in these maps. We don't get velocity information from the, the starlight reddening, but we do from the, uh, the gas maps. And then we can match those things up and match something at this distance with something at this velocity and learn things about how, the, how everything's moving. Um, we're also interested in a 3D stellar map. You see these nice, clean, simple models of a spiral galaxy. There's everybody know, everybody learned in school, there's a thin disk, a thick disk, a halo, a bulge. That's the Milky Way, you're done. And of course, it's way more complicated. There are all these little tidal streams and dwarf galaxies and you know, all kinds of things going on. So um, that was one of the great contributions of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to realize just how complicated and messy the stellar distribution is and that it's really telling you a lot about how the Milky Way was assembled over time. So we, we want access to all that information by looking at everything in 3D. So this is Haleakala. We like to put our telescopes on top of volcanoes. I think they're well insured. Um, PANSTARS is a tortured acronym for panoramic, 
guess I thought it was panchromatic. Okay, panoramic survey telescope and rapid response system. And um, the rapid response here, this is <clears throat> built by money from the uh, Air Force, actually. Congress was sold on the idea that a killer asteroid could come and get us any time, and we need to be watching for them. And they let us build this telescope. And uh, it's, not, it's not quite a boot. I mean, it actually is true that there are asteroids out there, and a lot of them have orbits that come close to the Earth, and we have the technology to look for them, so we probably should. I mean, that's not a, you know, not a ridiculous idea. But we can do a lot of other science also. So the idea was to have a relatively small telescope and a relatively big camera. So if you have a full-frame DSLR, your sensor's this big, right? Our sensor's this big. That's John Townry, the guy who built the camera. Uh, I mentioned him earlier. He was a grad student at Harvard, did that first redshift survey uh, decades ago. And now he builds things like that. Um, and he's built a second one, too. There are actually two Penn Stars telescopes now. And uh, for the last couple of years, they've been looking for killer asteroids full-time. But I'm going to show you data from uh, what they were doing kind of before that with this telescope. I had a chance to visit Haleakala and go up there and look in the primary mirror of the telescope. But you see it's not very big. Right? It's amazing the science you can do with a telescope that's only this wide. Uh, but it's got a heck of a camera. So it covers about three square degrees of sky. So if you hold up your hand at arm's length, you know, something like that. And... Uh, so this is about one field of view. I'm going to zoom in on the Trifid Nebula here to show that there's quite a bit of detail in the image. Yeah, just imagine every time you point a telescope, you get an image like that. Um, and you, just looking at this, you would assume you can learn something from dust. But again, I'm not really going to use the fact that there's nebulosity here and we're blocking the nebulosity. I'm only going to use star colors because that kind of works everywhere. It's only a tiny fraction of the sky where we have nebulosity to play with, but we really should do that someday. Be a good project. Um, so I always like to emphasize who actually did the work. Um, I only did a teeny tiny bit of the work in this project. Uh, it was originally pushed by Mario Yurich, who was a, a Hubble fellow here working with me, postdoctoral fellow, and then uh, this my student Eddie Schlafly calibrated the data from pan stars. You know, it, when we started doing this years ago, we uh, tried to make a map of dust, and our map of dust looked like a honeycomb pattern, because that's how they point the telescope, and we knew it, we had a problem. So he actually spent about a year just getting the data calibrated precisely enough. We have to be able to look from place to place on the sky and have our calibration not vary by more than about, uh, uh, you know, one percent. Um, and then this is a big statistics and computational problem, and Gregory Green did most of that work. So um, I'm not going to uh, bore you with the details of the model too much, but let's just say we're fitting four parameters for each star. Okay, there are two things that are about the star. What kind of star is it? Sort of how, how bright is it uh, in some absolute sense? And what is the metallicity of the star? Stars aren't pure hydrogen and helium. They have some metals mixed in. To, to an astronomer, metal is anything that's not hydrogen and helium. And uh, we often use iron as an indicator, but it uh, could be anything. And those, the presence of those metals in the star changes the, the color of the star. So we have those things that are intrinsic to the star, and then two things that are about where the star is. What's the distance to the star and the amount of dust in front of the star? And we have models of the colors of stars. Now, you might think, so yeah, this is kind of, you, you know astronomers are insane. I already emphasized that. We, we couldn't just plot the flux of something. We have to plot minus two and a half log 10 of the flux. Uh, and uh, so, you know, bigger numbers are fainter and things like that. And, uh, but that means because these are logarithms, this difference is really a flux ratio of green to red light. So this is a color, okay? And this is a magnitude and overall brightness. So brighter is up, redder is to the right. And stars fall on kind of this rainbow region depending on their metallicity. So that's very fortunate. If a star could have just any color and magnitude it wanted, we wouldn't be able to do this. It's very important that stars live on a fairly narrow slice in color magnitude space. This is a color-color space. This is one color and a different color. 
and you see this is a very tight uh, locus here. So we're doing this fit in some high dimension space, but I can't plot that, so I'm just showing you a couple slices. Then we do math, and then we have... Uh, <laughs> Okay, you like math, I know. So uh, we have a model for the uh, colors of the star and the five bands as a function of all these things I mentioned, the type of star, where it is, how much dust, and then um, a model for the errors. And then we can estimate those four parameters and then project them down to the 2D space we care about, just distance and reddening. We don't actually care what kind of star it is. We can circle back and do that at the end. Uh, and that's an interesting question, too. But for now, we just care about the distance and the dust. So, uh, you know, nature is sometimes kind. You'll get a star like this, and it's pretty well localized in distance and dust. And then you'll get one like this, and, oh, it could be that far away, or it could be that far away. We don't know. And that's just because the uh, in that high-dimension space of colors, dust pushes you in some direction. And sometimes... The, the locus of, you know, stars in that space is parallel with that. So you don't know, is a di different type of star at a different distance with a different amount of dust? You can't tell. So sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. But if you have enough stars, you can do things. So you do this for many stars, and then you combine 100 to 1,000 stars per pixel, and then estimate where the dust is along the line of sight in each of these pixels, and do this for millions of pixels because we have a billion stars. So we actually can do a thousand stars per pixel in millions of pixels. The numbers get kind of amazing. We can only do this because, you know, I, well, I just bought an eight terabyte drive for $330 the other day. I mean, you know, com computing is cheap these days. You could not have done something like this 15 years ago. Uh, so here is, th this is actually, um, not the very latest version of our map. It still has a few holes in it that have been filled in. Uh, and then one great big hole because we can't look through the Earth. The telescope's in Hawaii, and you can only see part of the sky from Hawaii. But you can see three quarters of it. So this is the galactic plane. Again, the galactic center is here. And you see this looks like dust. White is more dust. Black is less dust. So I'm, I'm treating it as if the dust is glowing here, so the dust is white. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in on this region here so you can see there's more detail. I'll zoom in again. There's more detail. It's really quite a nice map. And again, no far infrared photons were harmed in making this map. <laughs> um, this is just derived from the reddening of starlight. And I have to say this works better than I imagined. Um, one of the People who uh, you know, worked hard on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, Jelko Ivizic, he was a postdoc with me in Princeton, now he's a professor in uh, uh, Seattle. And Jelko told me about 10 years ago, you should really, you know, you should do this. You should try to get a distance and reading for each star and then combine them all and make a 3D map and it'll be a big Bayesian inference problem. It'll be fun. It'll only take a few million CPU hours, whatever. And I said, that'll never work. Um, which is usually what I say right before I try something. <laughs> and uh, and it, it actually works. So um, this, this is actually a 3D map. I'm just showing you a 2D projection of the 3D map. But the three-dimensionality can be seen better if we render it as if we're looking from a camera that's orbiting around the sun about 10 million times further than usual, so about 50 parsecs. Uh, let's just do that again. And we're looking in the direction of Taurus, Orion, the California Nebula, and so on. That's the California Nebula, not California. <laughs> California's there. Um, uh, sorry, there. <laughs> That's the sun. This, is the, this might look funny to you. Um, we don't live in the galactic plane. We're above it by about 20 parsecs. And so we actually have to represent the sun as being up out of the galactic plane. If we do this right. Here's um, starting back from the sun and flying towards and through in the direction of Orion. There's a cloud called Monoceros R2 that's kind of right behind Orion. It's known to be about twice as far away, and you'll see that because we'll fly past the Orion junk. And then, uh, see, so yeah, 
Monar 2 is back there. And by now we've gotten a little underneath the galactic plane, so we'll go up through it and go up high and turn the camera around and look down on the galaxy. And then you'll see how lousy our map is. Because, hey, I didn't mean to, I just wanted to stop. Drats. Um, so the point is here, our angular resolution is extremely good, right? Because we know where the stars are angularly. Our distance resolution is coming from this big messy inference problem with lots of uncertainty. And so our volume elements are very long and skinny. The aspect ratio is much longer than the laser pointer. You know, it's, um, so if we stay near the sun, those volume elements are foreshortened when we render them and the map doesn't look too bad. The further we go from the sun, the worse the map looks. So when we go way the heck above the galaxy, thousands of light years and look down, you can see how coarse the distance bins are. So we'd really like more distance resolution. Still, you see, see these holes over here? Um, we didn't know about those holes because when we look from our usual vantage point, we can't see them. So you know, there are things like that that pop out, even with this rather poor distance resolution, we've really learned a lot about uh, the galaxy. So, um, okay, so we, we have this 3D dust map. Um, Christine warned me against saying too much about RV uh, because from your perspective, it's probably a detail, but it really is important in the application of all of this stuff to real science that we know about the shape of the Redding Law. And uh, it's actually kind of interesting. So we have a scheme using near infrared spectra of stars that I won't go into to measure RV on a star by star basis for about 400,000 stars over this region. We've only done it in these circles that look like red, white, and blue. And the background image is just, you know, some dust for orientation. Um, but you can see there's a bunch of blue, there's a bunch of red, there's a bunch of blue. There are these large scale coherent features. Um, so this is actual data and this is Eddie Schlafly's model. He's put together a three dimensional model of what's what and what the RV is in different places. And then we project through that to simulate what we would have observed from the model. And you see it looks quite similar. So that's, that's rather exciting. We're starting to get a handle on not just where the dust is in three dimensions, but how its optical properties change in three dimensions. And that's never been done before. So um, come back in a few years and I might be able to show you something really impressive. We are, uh, as part of the next iteration of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, it, it's been a wonderful project, by the way. It was, it was a five-year mission that started in 2001, sort of ended in 2006. And then there was Sloan 2, and then Sloan 3, and then Sloan 4. And now we're planning, uh, we have to call it after Sloan 4. We're not allowed to call it Sloan 5 until the Sloan Foundation tells us we can. Um, so uh, after Sloan 4 will uh, be a five-year project to do a bunch of new things, and um, including taking the kinds of data we have that we made the red, white, and blue circles out of over this whole region. So we'll be able to make a, a solid filled in map of everything. We still have a lot to do. Um, Gaia is particularly exciting um, now that we're starting to get information. The initial release was just positions and um, star brightnesses, uh, mostly except for some very bright stars. But in a year, they're going to release the, the parallax distances and the motions and all kinds of great stuff. And that's really going to help our fit here, right? Because right now we're only using the star brightnesses and colors to learn things about distance. If we have an actual trigonometric measurement of the distance from Gaia, that's a far more powerful thing. So uh, I think that'll help a lot. And then in a few years when LSST turns on, we'll just have much, much um, more sensitive data on about 10 times as many stars. We'll, have, we'll be able to use 10 billion stars instead of 1 billion. And I think that'll really sharpen things up. So this is gonna be exciting. Um, I like making a dust map this way. There's no zodiacal light from interplanetary dust. There's no large scale structure leaking in. That's a problem I didn't mention, but it's a big problem. Um, if you, you go and map dust using gas, you have dust to gas ratio variations. We don't have any of that. So, you know, there are many kinds of problems that just don't happen if we make dust maps this way. And um, I think the, the signal to noise of this will be good enough, actually. So I think 
um, we're going to be able to do this. So I should start wrapping up. It's 8.10, but <coughs> I just wanted to mention a couple things about the future and the past. So you may have heard of the, the Breakthrough Starshot initiative. Um, this is headed up by Avi Loeb here at, at Harvard. He's the chair of the astronomy department and uh, also the director of the Black Hole Initiative and the Institute for Theory and Computation, and he's kind of a busy guy. So the idea here is uh, Yuri Milner wants us to send a spacecraft to the nearest star, and uh, that's especially cool now that we know Proxima Centauri has a planet around it. You may have heard that news recently. So uh, to get there, we want to go point to the speed of light for about 20 years. The um, idea was it would take 20 years to design and build this thing, 20 years to get there, and then about four or five years for the signal to come back. So that sounds a lot like 2060. So eat your broccoli. Um, I don't know. I might make it. My grandma lived to be 94. Uh, but uh, anyway, for the young people in the room, you might, might, might live to see a spacecraft get to another star. Uh, but whether we do it in 2060 or 2160 or 3000, you know, someday we're going to do things like this. And believe it or not, one of the big concerns is when you're going that fast, when you're going a good fraction of the speed of light, if you hit a dust grain, it can be catastrophic. So, you know, it's been kind of an, uh, an abstract question until now. Oh, look at the pretty dust. But if you're a spacecraft flying through the dust, you've got to worry about it. So... Um, if you skip ahead a thousand years and ask what we'll be doing, uh, you know, where will we be going and what kinds of maps will we need? And that got me thinking um, about the past. So here's a crude map. I was, um, I did a junior year abroad in Freiburg, Germany. And one of the tourist attractions there when you walk through the, the old part of town is the home of Waldsee Müller. Martin Waldseemüller, and he made this map. And it's a famous map because he uh, named something after Americi Vespucci. So somewhere on here is written something like America, and it's the first time that was written on a map. But you see here, you know, they kind of knew what the outline of Europe looked like, and they had Africa pretty well down. There were a lot of trade routes. Um, but at the time, this was North America. <laughs> okay, very crude map. But it was a useful map. Um, it really expanded human consciousness to encompass, well, almost the whole Earth. They didn't know what was on the other side of that thing, but they were getting close to really kind of encompassing the entire Earth for the first time. And um, so that's just my argument that crude maps can be useful. So not that our maps are as important as Waldseemuller maps, but... Uh, you know, previous attempts to map the Milky Way in 3D have been extremely crude, and we're starting to do better. And I think with the upcoming data sets in the next few years, we're going to do a lot better. And so you, you kind of only make your good 3D map of the Milky Way for the first time once. And uh, whatever happens in a thousand years when we're flying off to, you know, whatever star to go on vacation, um, we'll need our dust map. And maybe someone will ask, who made the first dust map? You know. <laughs> so who knows where that will lead. So I'll stop there. Thanks. All right. Now we are going to open it up for questions and answers. We have a question. Yes, sir. I'll put something more exciting on the screen. Mostly about dust rather than gas. And when I read about nebulae, they, they talk mainly about gas. But what can you say about the relationship between dust and gas and the contrast between them? Yeah, so that's a good question about uh, gas in nebulae. And, you know, there is, mass wise, there's at least 100 times as much gas as dust. So uh, the gas is extremely important for everything, dynamics, chemistry, you know, everything, you make stars out of gas. So it is true that, I think it's, it's safe to say far more people think about the gas than the dust. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm just, um, 
in terms of cosmological foregrounds and what it's doing for, um, you know, emitting microwaves that interfere with the CMB and things like that, it's the dust that matters, not the gas. So in my career, I've tended to focus on the dust. But there's a great deal going on in the, da the gas, and it's very interesting. And in fact, there's a relatively new telescope array in the southern hemisphere, ALMA, in the Atacama Desert, that looks at very detailed um, uh, kind of microwave submillimeter um, molecular lines. And they, they can look at the chemistry going on in the gas and talk about the ratios of all these obscure you know, molecules that I don't even know what they are. But uh, they're learning a lot about the chemistry going on out there in the gas. So that, that's kind of a whole subfield also. There's a gentleman on the far side yet. Yes. So my question is, what do you think is uh, all this stuff? I can assume that there's probably things going on in like stars, and you know, uh, black holes. Why do you think it's going on with it? Yeah, we think that a dust grain has kind of a long and complicated life and may actually um, get formed somewhere and then wander around for a while and then maybe a supernova explodes and a shockwave goes by and breaks it into pieces and then maybe the, later on those pieces are in a cold molecular cloud and they accrete some material and then they go and get baked somewhere and kind of get transformed by that and then maybe another shockwave goes by and this might happen 10 or 20 times and then finally they'll get destroyed somehow or you know, fall into a star or fall into something. But uh, that it, it's kind of like, well, I don't know, it's quite like a grain of sand on a beach. There are places where the sand's coming from something very local. You, know, you go to Hawaii, there's a black beach, there's a green beach, there's a white beach. You, know, that you, you can see where the sand is coming from very locally. But there are other places where the sand has just been pushed around and mixed for who knows how long, and different kinds of sand from different places have all come together. So I think it's the same kind of thing. Let's see, any questions go right over here on the other side? <coughs> yeah, I was wondering, you were saying about possibly creating a map for, for interstellar travel so that, you know, you're going point to the speed of light, uh, a little grain of dust doesn't put a huge hole in whatever vehicle that would be. But if but the dust is moving, right? And you're saying it's also affected not only by that there's this kind of level of dispersion, uh, I'd imagine you have to have some type of algorithm or something like that to calculate its 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 its, its uh, like how it's dispersing. Then you'd also have a lot of uh, random variables like the um, shock waves that would be moving it into completely different positions. So yeah. So fortunately, the dust is moving a thousandth the speed of light or less, so it's not moving too much. Um, I mean, we wouldn't be making a map of individual dust grains, yeah. obviously. It's more just you don't want to drive through the place where the dust is a thousand times thicker if you don't need to. Just like when they send the interplanetary probes out, they try to avoid certain places in the asteroid belt or the rings of Saturn or whatever. You know, you try to be careful where you're sending your spacecraft. Um, but even then, there's, you know, there's a little bit of grit everywhere, and you can always just hit something, and that's it. So. Uh, gentleman, that's the second row up from the back. Yeah. With the glasses, yeah. <laughs> Are there any regions in the sky for which uh, dust has been mapped uh, by other methods, and have you been able to compare to anything like that? Yeah, so we, um, there are other three-dimensional dust maps made with near-infrared data, um, actually partly by people at Harvard uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, they're over, they tend to be over a small part of the sky and the distance resolution is even worse than what I showed you and so on. But we agree as well as you would expect. Um, then we look and see if the projected version of our 3D map projected down to 2D and compare it to other 2D maps. And so in our papers on this, we have quantitative comparisons that show that that works well. But just in terms of an overall 3D reality check, there are no other maps that are this good actually. You, you might think there are. You, you go watch movies, you see them flying through things, and you know, the, the artist's conceptions are so good, you start to think we really know where stuff is, but we don't. Are there any questions up in the balcony? No, Larry? The young lady right here. Um, why did you go to the study of interplanetary dust? 
Well, um, my mother wanted me to. <laughs> uh, the, the question is why I went into this. So actually, I went to, to Berkeley as a physics student, not as an astronomy student. I was going to be a particle physicist uh, because I started subscribing to Discover Magazine in 1981, and I read all about the discovery of quarks, and you know, I wanted to know what quarks were made of, and that kind of thing. So, um, And then I got there, and uh, there was this guy named Nima Arkani Hamed, who was obviously a million times smarter than me, and I thought, oh, I guess you have to be as smart as Nima to uh, be a particle physicist, so I guess I'll do something else. <laughs> and um, it, it turns out he's one of the best in the world, so I wish. There's just unlucky. Um, and uh, I was really interested in cosmology. I took a class, and the teacher of the class, uh, you know, last day of class, he said, thank you, everyone. Go away, go home. And we're all walking out, and he said, oh, by the way, I just got a grant to make a dust map. I don't really know anything about dust. If any of you are interested, come talk to me. So that's that's how it started. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I went to him and I said, I don't know, dust doesn't sound that interesting. He said, this will only take you like three weeks, it'll just be a summer project, and we'll do something real, and, and three years later, we were done. <laughs> okay. uh, the woman back there, thanks. Um, so you showed in the 3 map uh, two black hole areas, two empty holes. Is that like a, um, a blind spot, or is there like dark matter, dark energy? No, there's just less dust there. But does yeah. dark matter or dark energy does it affect your calculations anyway? So dark matter uh, is one of the worst misnomers in the field. It's really invisible matter, right? If you had a clump of dark matter in the room, you would see right through it. So uh, I really wish they had named it invisible matter instead of dark matter. Um, yeah, dust actually blocks light, but dark matter doesn't. And and the same with dark energy. It's um, it's just invisible. So yeah, those. Those spots with less dust were, you know, probably there was a supernova that just kind of either destroyed or pushed back the dust in those regions. Yes, gentlemen, right there. Yeah, um, are the structures um, in your map there, are they changing enough in a human lifetime that you need to update your map periodically? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone from the NSF here? Yes, actually, we do. We need, uh, we need funding. Um, we need more money to update the power. No, I mean, the um, when we talk about something like Gaia watching stars move, it's measuring the positions of stars at the kind of five milli arc second level. And our resolution is more like five arc minutes, so that's what a factor of sixty thousand. So I mean that, yeah, the angular scale on which we're doing this is just huge compared to the scale on which things move on a human lifetime. Over here. I'm trying to get a visceral sense of the density of the dust. You know, he's the thing. Yeah, good. In planetary space with a vacuum, and this looks like a sandstorm. <laughs> right. So um, one of the old-time professors who unfortunately passed away before I got here, uh, Ed Purcell, used to do this in his interstellar medium class. He would take some chalk on the chalkboard and say, I'm going to start rubbing chalk on the chalkboard. Stop me when I get to the you know, typical amount of dust. If you integrate all the thousands of light years through the galaxy, you know, stop me when I get there. And you have to stop them almost immediately, right? It's the, the center of the galaxy is 25,000 light years away. If you take all the dust between here and there and stack it together, it, you know, it would be like the chalk on the chalkboard. <laughs> really incredibly low density. But it's enough to block light, right? It's enough to affect these sensitive measurements we do. It's still enough to destroy a spaceship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even, you know, a one micron dust grain, if it hits you at 0.2 the speed of light, it's a lot of energy. We have time for two more questions, and I'll go with the gentleman in the green shirt. Uh, uh, in, the, in the beginning, you started out by saying uh, that silicon was one of the elements of uh, either from taken from a sample or um, that it's presumed to be from the uh, interplanetary dust. So is that um, is that a basic element, or is that the silicon formed by cosmic forces? 
Um, How is it silicon? We think the silicon forms in certain kinds of supernovae and uh, certain kinds of stars that, you know, the more massive stars, they um, produce what we call alpha elements. So an alpha is just a helium nucleus. So it kind of keeps smashing helium nuclei together and building bigger and bigger things. And you uh, get to silicon. It's one of the ones that's quite stable. So you get a lot of it. Same with oxygen. So then when I say silicate, you know, that's just silicon and oxygen together. And um, most of the Earth's crust is silicates. Aluminum silicates, magnesium silicates, iron silicates. That's actually what most of the Earth's crust is. So this is very common stuff. Okay. All right. Yep. Last one. Yes, sir. Earlier in the talk, you had mentioned that most of the interstellar dust that's caught in the solar system would have fallen into the sun within a million years. Um, I would have thought the sun would have blown it out of the solar system. What's the mechanism that drives it to come in? Um, so that's a very good point. I was being a bit glib. So um, people actually do careful calculations of this. It's neat. So if the dust is actually interstellar and starting way out there and coming towards the sun, um, dust grains that are small enough, the smaller they are, the more they feel radiation pressure. And they'll get deflected and never get captured by the solar system at all. So actually, if there were you know quarter micron dust grains around, they would be coming from asteroids, by which I might mean things as small as pebbles, but maybe you know big asteroids, uh, colliding and grinding in the asteroid belt. And so you make a whole bunch of small dust grains there, and then they get dragged into the sun, but they're coming from the asteroid belt, not from, uh, from far away. We can actually see that effect, by the way. There are fairly detailed maps of the stuff coming from the asteroid belt. And get it dragged into the sun. It's just there's not very much of it. So yeah, that's that's a good point. A quarter micron dust grain that starts far away will never even get into the solar system, but one that's made in the solar system will get dragged into the sun. It's, I know it's counterintuitive, right? It's yeah. Far away, the radiation pressure is more important. And is the diagonal light that is that all new dust that's being generated all the time, or is that different? Yeah, it's pretty much new dust being generated by grinding in the asteroid belt. All right, and with that, we are going to wrap up this evening. Those of you who are here on site are free to come up and ask additional questions. Please join us again next month, and let's thank our speakers.